and we're not protecting the environment for the sake of the fishes and the birds, as I said at the beginning. We're protecting it because we recognize that nature is the infrastructure of our communities. And if you ask these people on Capitol Hill who are promoting these kind of rollbacks, you know, why are you doing this? I spent a lot of my time doing that. What they invariably say, you know, we seem to say, well, you have children too. How can you do this? How can you cut them? How can you get yourself into a place where you think it's okay to cut down those mountains? What they invariably say is, well, the time has come in our nation's history where we have to choose now between economic prosperity on the one hand and environmental protection on the other. And that is a false choice in 100% of the situation. It's another big lie in 100% of the situations. Good environmental policy is identical to good economic policy. If Economy, and this is how we ought to be measuring it, based upon how it produces jobs and the dignity of jobs over the generations, over the long term, and how it preserves the value of the assets of our communities. If, on the other hand, we want to do what they've been urging us to do on Capitol Hill, which is to treat the planet as if it were a business in liquidation, convert our natural resources to cash as quickly as possible, have a few years of pollution-based prosperity, we can generate an instantaneous cash flow and the illusion of a prosperous economy. But our children are going to pay for our joyride, and they're going to pay for it with denuded landscapes and poor health and huge cleanup costs that amplify over time, and that they'll never be able to pay. Environmental injury is deficit spending. It's a way of loading the cost of our generation's prosperity onto the backs of our children. And one of the things that I've done over the past several years is to constantly go around and confront this argument that an investment in our environment is a diminishment of our nation's wealth. It doesn't diminish our wealth. It's an investment in infrastructure. The same as investing, like the mayor said, you know, investing in these trees. It's not going to cost us. It's an investment in the infrastructure of the city. The same as investing in telecommunications and road construction. It's an investment we have to make if we're going to ensure the economic vitality of our generation and the next generation. And you know, all this word sustainability means is that God wants us to use the things that we've been given, the bounties of the earth, to enrich ourselves, to improve our quality of life, to serve others. But we can't use them up. We can't sell the farm piece by piece in order to pay for the groceries. We can't drain the pond to catch the fish. We can't cut down the mountain to get at the coal. We can live off the interest. We can't go into the capital. That belongs to our children. And, you know, and we're trustees for them. And when, you know, I, I want to say this thing. There is no stronger advocate for free market capitalism than myself. I believe that the free market is the most efficient and democratic way to distribute the goods of the land, and that the best thing that could happen to the environment is if we had true free market capitalism in this country. My friend Jim Hightower, who some of you know, because I know some of you from Texas, says, you know, the free market is a great system, we should try it sometime. But we don't have it in this country. You know, uh, in a true free market, uh, uh, the, the marketplace promotes efficiency. And efficiency means the elimination of waste, and pollution is waste. And the free market would encourage us to properly value our natural resources, and it's the undervaluation of those resources that cause us to use them wastefully. But in a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich, and without enriching your community. But what polluters do, is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. They raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for everybody else. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. And you know, if you're a polluting industry, one of the most obvious ways to do that is to shift your cleanup costs to the public and make yourself a billionaire by poisoning the residents. 
And, you know, when the Southern Company puts mercury out over the Ohio Valley in one of its stacks, and it falls on New York State, and it poisons our children's brains, and it makes it so I can't eat the fish and, and, and I catch anymore. And, you know, I buy a fishing license for 30 bucks every year. And the Constitution of New York State says that the people of the state own the fisheries of the state. They're not owned by the governor or the legislature or the fisheries department. They're owned by the people. They're certainly not owned by the Southern Company. They're owned by the people. Everybody has a right to use them. Nobody can use them in a way that will diminish or injure their use and enjoyment by others. This is ancient law. It goes back to Roman times. It's in the Code of Justinian. It's in, I'll tell you a little history lesson, and this is a bit of a digression, but this entire talk has turned into a digression. <laughs> The, uh, the, 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 the law was that all of those things that are not susceptible to private ownership, but by their nature are shared resources of the community, and they enumerated them. The Code of Justinian enumerated the air, the water, the flowing waters, the wandering animals, the dune lands, the wetlands, the fisheries, the aquifers, and, and, and they, uh, uh, the public forests. They had public lands even at that time. That they belonged to the people. Everybody could use them. Nobody can use more than their, their share. If you were a citizen of Rome, whether you were black or white, uh, African or European, humble or noble, rich or poor, you had an absolute right to cross the beach, throw in a net, and take out your share of the fish. The emperor himself couldn't stop it. But the first act of every tyranny always includes efforts to privatize the commons, to steal them from the people. And when Roman law broke down here, the constitutional government broke down. You saw um, all, in every jurisdiction in Europe, the feudal kings and local lords began reasserting control over the public trust resources. For example, in England, King John said um, the, that the, the deer, which used to be a primary food source for the poor, now belong only to the nobility, only we can hunt them. And that's what got him in trouble with Robin Hood. He also erected navigational tolls on the towns and the rivers of England so that what was, what was once once free, where people could go up and down the river without paying, they now had to pay for it. And he sold monopolies to the fishermen, so that only the wealthy could catch the fish unless you pay for it. And this called, caused a revolution in England. And the public rose up, and they met him at the ba Battle of Runnymede. And they forced King John to, John to sign the Magna Carta, which was the beginning of constitutional democracy on this planet. And the Magna Carta has all of our Bill of Rights in it, including, you know, ones we don't have anymore, like Hades Corpus. <laughs> and, um, 